It's amazing how many people start a conversation with me with the words, I'm sorry. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And today, Jody has a story about what I think is every parent's dilemma that turned into a really interesting conversation about business and communication and honesty and barriers you may never even have known existed. And speaking of barriers, which this isn't one, but that was my lame segue. Good segue, yeah. <laughs> Um, If you'd like to have less barrier to... uh, No, anyway. If you are liking this show, please uh, tell a friend, share it with someone, post about it somewhere. We are in service of our... In celebration of our birthday month, we are looking to add more people to our community. So there you go. Okay. So here's my story. Uh, Last Wednesday was my daughter's first day of school back. So first day of school last Wednesday. Thursday afternoon at like 2, 2 2.30, I get a call from the school nurse that she has, I know exactly, that she has not even technically a fever. It's like 99.1 and then it was 99.5, but she came into the office because she had a really bad headache. She goes, I don't even think you need to come get her. The day's almost over. Just, but I wanted to let you know, you're probably going to have an evening. (laughs) Here it comes. Okay. And so fair enough, done. And, you know, and this will be kind of the point of the story. I'm a, I'm a very, um, you know, I, I don't rush my kids to the doctor the first time they have a little fever. You know, fever serve yeah. a purpose. I've been around the block. It's like, you know, throw them some Motrin, see how they do, whatever. So the next morning, it's like 101.4 in the morning. Mm. So definitely a fever, yeah. definitely staying home from school, all good. Um, I decided to work from home that day. And then most of the day, her fever's at like 102.5, which is, you know, that's a not, fever. yeah, that's a fever. Yeah. But we were at a place where I couldn't give her more Motrin yet. So it comes the moment where I can give her more Motrin. I know this is not an ad for Motrin, <laughs> ibuprofen, and uh, I give it to her. So at that point, it's 103.5, wow. which now has my attention, yeah, absolutely. has my attention. But um, so we give it to her. And then an hour later, 45 minutes later, my expectation is it will be tanking at this point. You know, sure. It will come down from there. It's 104.5. Oh, so, you know, every parent listening is probably like, oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's that's real. That's a for real thing. Yeah. So here's the funny thing. It was really clear to me that it was time to go to urgent care. And of course, of course, the timing of all this is it's now like six o'clock. So I can't call her real doctor, which maybe I should have called him earlier, but this is kind of the whole point to this story. So we go to urgent care and all she has is this headache and the really high fever. And the funny thing about this story, the thing that I think will tie into a very fascinating business thing is when you react and when when you don't and when something is overreaction, because Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how universal this is, but I've talked to several moms in the last few days and they were all like, oh my God, Yes, that nobody wants to be that mom that that, you know, goes rushing to the doctor and it's nothing. It's why you try and sort of figure it out in advance because you don't want them to be like, well, sorry, just a virus. Go home because you sort of feel like an idiot for some reason. I don't know why, because no no one expects us to be the medical professional. I I understand completely. And yet that's what you feel like. So hysterically, and I kept finding this funny, we're sitting there at urgent care. My daughter has a fever of 104.5. And I am still somehow worried that they're going to be like, oh, it's one of those moms who brought, I mean, (laughs) this is a clear symptom. And I still had, I kept finding myself wanting to say things like, you know, I I have a 17-year-old son, ergo establishing that I have a long record and I've never rushed a kid to the hospital for for a fever before. Like I kept wanting to say things like that. And I did say a couple things sort of like that. And the guy just sort of looked at me like, okay, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, to make a very long story short, um, they ruled out strep. They took a bunch of blood work. They checked appendicitis. They kept checking things. She had this tiny bit of a cough. It wasn't even a cough. It was more just like sort of clear your throat, dry throat kind of thing. And so the doctor said, you know, just just as a precaution, do you mind if I take a chest x-ray? And which frankly, I was a little bit like, oh, come on. That's she doesn't even have a cough. And he had listened to her chest, nothing. Um, turns out she had double pneumonia, which is wow, serious. It's not a small deal. Yeah. They, and so then, of course, I was super happy that that we went, you yeah. know, and, and then I felt validated. I was like, see, I took it. It was a good reason. <laughs> I'm a good parent. But, but, I, but ever since then, I was thinking about that, that funny thing of, and, and whether it's a different set of dynamics of when something happens in your business or on your team, or even for yourself, you can want to react. But then, you know, this dynamic of like, well, I don't want to be the person who overreacted 
to this thing. I mean, I've often thought about how this works with like recalls and things like something happens with one of your products. You're like, well, I want people to be safe. But was this just like a random event? I don't want to go screaming the sky is falling if this was a one off thing. Like when you call it, when you decide that a thing is a thing and you have to take action versus when you kind of hold back and wait and risk regretting not acting sooner. And that whole dynamic of what how you make those decisions. And, you know, ultimately, if it had been nothing, and they sent us home with nothing, because, you know, certainly, if it's a virus, you don't throw antibiotics at it. And I'd have been fine with that. But um, it's just kind of a funny thing. I thought I'd so I'm gonna, uh, because there are so many things that come up in my mind, I'm actually going to itemize my list. I'm just gonna read. (laughs) I'm gonna because I've been taking notes as you've been watching. I saw that I'm gonna read my list. So the first thing that I wrote down, which I thought was really important was the nurse called when there were there were red flags, but there's small, tiny little red flags, and they weren't really oh, too far funny. up uh-huh. up the mast, right? Mm-hmm. But she knew that obviously this is not normal. She knew that that Kaya was there, but not faking it there. I mean, she was there for a reason. No, in fact, the nurse said, your mom can come and get you if you want. And she's like, no, 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 I want to stay. That, that's the kind yeah. of kick. <laughs> so, but the nurse, the nurse called you even though because uh, she perceived red flags, but the nurse wouldn't have rushed her to patient care or right. recommended that yep. she rushed patient. But she recognized the red flags, and so she thought, okay, it's worth mentioning. The second thing I wrote down was, I always think of Seinfeld when I think of this, but it's not you, it's me, the the um, the breakup line. And that's that's kind of, for me, that's the filter of trying to figure out, is this thing I'm perceiving a whole situation with the company, or is it just oh. is it just the individual who's not handling this well, right. or who's not dealing, or doesn't perceive this, or didn't understand, or whatever? So I want to know, right, right. like, is it a symptom of a thing, or is it a root cause? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. What is it? So if there's somebody who's really dissatisfied, or let's say that somebody quits in your organization, they just want to find something else. And for my situation, when so if somebody gives me notice, I want to think well. Is there something that that I need to fix in my firm because this person who I thought was really good left? Or was it, was it one her them? or yeah. because it wasn't the right fit? Not that they're a defective or deficient person, but it well, wasn't was the, the right, right fit, fit for them. Yeah. For them. Or did uh, was there a miscommunication in that? I don't have to fix the job, but I should really communicate the job better to mm. the next candidate. So I wanted so I wrote that it's not you, it's me. It's it's kind of figuring out, you know, whether it is us or whether it's it's <laughs> limited to this. The last note that I wrote down was the fact that you said that it was six o'clock, so you can't call your doctor. What that means is that your ability to communicate with somebody who matters is automatic, is limited at that point. Hmm. So you're making a, you're forced to make this decision. In your case, it's patient care or more Motrin, you know, at home in isolation. In other words, you have to figure out whether it's serious enough to communicate with somebody else. Well, actually, so this will be a fascinating place to take it that I didn't think was going to be where we went. But I I will add another layer that I considered having as a separate episode at some point that makes it really interesting. Because I can call my doctor. Like they have an answering service. Mm -hmm. I can call They'll leave a message. Either he or the other doctor will call me back. They'll triage questions. They, right. I've used that many times when it's appropriate. But I knew that if at that time of the day, if the answer was you need to get this checked out, he would have suggested that I go to one of two ERs. I didn't want to go to those two ERs. Mm-hmm. I would prefer to go to the urgent care patient first that I tend to go to. And not that I couldn't have made that choice, yeah. but then I would have to say, no, 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 I'd rather go here. And here's what's interesting. Patient first, going back to some other episodes we have, have taken the art of like making it easy and the customer experience to a level that is just beyond good. They, you know, we could do the x rays right there. They, at the end of the day, when she needed antibiotics and this special cough medicine, they had it right there. They handed it to me. I didn't have to go anywhere else. Two more layers to that. They, um, they came in one time. The guy just came in to get something. He was like, are you cold, honey? And she's like, yeah, it's a little cold in here. He comes back with not just a blanket, a heated blanket. Like oh, it's nice. like out of the, uh, out of the, the um, and I said, oh, are those right out of the dryer? He goes, no, we just keep them in a thing because then they're just really soothing. And then to top it off, they have added... And I think this is kind of new. The plug right beside where the little bed is, they put in, they changed it to like a four plug thing and they put a little like handmade label on the top that says phone charger. And then they actually have this one cable plugged in that 
at the end of it has like nine dongles of every kind of of mm. like electronic charger you can possibly imagine because they recognize if you're there waiting and you're there maybe longer than you thought you'd be or something that that the added stress of your phone running out of batteries is just something you don't need and probably ultimately makes their lives less pleasant but there were so many barriers to if I called my regular doctor yeah. versus this like smooth act. If I went to patient first, it would all be like easy and simple and I'd get what I need. Well, first of all, it makes it seem like whether I have pneumonia or I just need a spa day, I should go to <laughs> patient first, um, which really never occurred to me. But the right, I mean, you have a right to to choose and it's good that you know what options you would choose if something goes south, right? If it's not going to be the Motrin thing. But what's interesting to me is the fact that you got to a point where in terms of trying to triage, is this a real thing or is this something that I can handle? I've seen a thousand times, I don't know, whatever. You were making that decision in isolation as opposed to talking about it, which means that when you finally went to patient first, you needed to validate that there was a thing. Well, I do think that this is, now it sort of feels like Jody psychotherapy or something. I do think it's an interesting thing. It certainly happens a lot in the medical field, but this is also a, a thing I catch myself doing all the time where before I will reach out to an expert about a thing, I want to sort of try and figure it out myself first as if that's the right chain of events, which it is not. Like, there's, I mean, there's some there's some personal, you know, there's some first level triage to do on a thing just to, and, and that's sort of the point to this question. Like, you, you don't go calling a neurosurgeon every time you have a headache. I mean, th like, that's really clear. But between doing nothing and wildly overreacting, there are so many steps along the way where you have to decide, like, is this a point where I reach out to somebody or is this a point where it should stay in my own circle of care kind of? Right. Well, that's so that's where I really think the importance lies, because I think that it's important to have people around you, whether it's in your case, medical or legal or accounting or banking or, or what have you, where the perceived level of seriousness before you talk to them is brought down a number of steps. So you don't, yes. because- Oh gosh, you must see this all the time. Like if, I see if, if you're my time. lawyer, oh, I hadn't even thought I about that I see it yet. all the time. <laughs> and, you know, even when people call me and they know that I've set up my business model to right. be able to address this. Me too. But- it's amazing how many people start a conversation with me with the words, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I'm, I'm really sorry to sorry bother, to you, bother with you with this. <laughs> I'm sorry to bother you. And I'm like, this, look, I would Literally be unemployed if people didn't quote unquote bother me with this. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> and frankly, this is what I like to do. I like to serve as general counsel. I like it when people call me with this. Yes. And, and if the worst thing that happens, see, the worst thing that happens in their world is I tell them, Oh, you really don't have to worry about that. You're several steps away from anything happening and and it's fine. Right. And there's no reason that person should feel silly no. for worrying about that thing. I know that's why it's so inane that that I worry so much about being but but I have vetted this not not in order to vet it, but in talking about this the last few days, because she's currently sick right now, um, with other moms who've like checked in with me, they've all been like, oh my God, me too. I hate to look like that mom that like right. rushes their kid to the doctor and so, for nothing. And so in business, you know, you, you're you like, well, yeah, geez. So I do a lot of construction, as you know, and and people say, you know what, I, I don't want to call my, my bonding agent because I think there might be a problem, but I'm not sure if there's a problem on this project. And, and I hear so many bonding agents say, we're your advocate, call us. And we can tell you, right. hey, this happens a thousand times, you know, really just take care of it, but it's not a big deal. And and the bonding agents, the good ones, lament to me a lot that yeah, we don't get those calls that we should be getting. Well, that's really funny because, and I hadn't thought about this, but it, it's probably why this issue spun up for me is that you and I have both gone to massive links to organize our business models in a way that I won't say forces people, but like eases the path for people to call us at the early. I mean, it's why right. I stopped. It's why you have your empty hourglass program. Mm -hmm. It's why I stopped having hardly any, we meet once a month appointments. Like if you, yeah. if you're one of my one-on-one -on -one clients and there's a monthly fee, I took those out so that your only choice is to call me when you have a problem. Because even if we meet once a month regularly, people still hesitate. They're like, well, I knew I was going to meet with you in two weeks. I'm like, yeah, but it, right. it's not going to be a problem in two weeks. And you worried like, about it for two weeks and you lost sleep over it for yeah, two weeks. When we yeah. could have just solved it. So I, I took right. all those away and then and then people would would finally call me, you know, just text me like, do you have a couple minutes? Can we do this? And that, that has worked really well. But to back it up, my 
pediatrician has would probably love it if I called. Like they probably want you to call, you know, whenever you have a concern. Maybe I'm making that assumption. But there's been no easing of that. In fact, it's off hours. You know, you have to Mm -hmm. call. You have to leave a message. Then, interestingly, then I have to worry about when he calls back because I don't want to not answer when he calls back. So I'm not going to call and leave the message right before I go into a three-hour meeting because I don't know how to time when he's going to call back. Um, So it's just, it's just, it's complicated. And so they don't ease that path to enable me to call sooner. And what's interesting is to add another layer to it, um, it was just kind of funny. So my husband, who, if we're making this sort of metaphor here, was sort of like my leadership team of parenting, you know, we're we're partners in the parenting thing here. He is somebody who, and I think it's kind of a subconscious thing because he certainly... Uh, with certain things, it's like, oh, we need to go to the doctor for that. Um, the, the, the time that I was having weird chest pains right before I was leaving for an international trip for a week, and I was like, oh, my chest hurts. And he's oh, like, why oh. are you not at the ER? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> go. Um, turned out to be nothing. But um, but he, especially with the kids, I think, this is my my diagnosis, just wants things to be okay so much that like she's sitting with 104.5 fever. And I was like, I think I'm going to go to urgent care. And he's like, well, you know, why don't we have her just take a cool bath and see if that helps? I'm like, but what's funny is having somebody say that meant it was just like another hurdle because I was already Mm -hmm. struggling with my own sort of weird internal dialogue. And then I'd say like, no, I, I I think it's time. Like it, it, so, so when you have other voices around you who are saying like, this isn't Oh, let's let, let's just not worry about that thing. Let's just so you know to what you're talking about. If one of your clients is having a, a legal issue and they're a little bit worried, but they're all sitting there around a table, you know, even if they're starting to feel like, oh, we should really call Elliot about this. I, I suspect there are other voices like, oh, I'm, I'm sure it's not a big deal. Let's not. Yeah, let's I, just let me, let's make it go away. I hear right? that anecdotally. Oh, well, I don't think it's time to get Elliot involved yet. And so they think that involved, just like on a medical field, involved means well, we have to prep her for surgery, or involved yes. means I have to go into litigation. And and it's not that. And I think about this with with other businesses. So one business, um, you can tell me whether this is is strained and off point or whether this is is what I think it is. So you take Jiffy Lube. So Jiffy Lube and some of these quick change oil places, they went to um, a model where they'll change your oil, but they'll say that if at any time before you have your scheduled next oil change appointment, you need a top off, you come in and we do it for free. For the oil or for... For the oil or for any other fluids that they they change. Um, And so what they wanted to do, and I have a number of clients who are large uh, Jiffy Loop franchisees, they say, well, what we really wanted to do was have people kind of view us as their go-to mechanic. We're not really a mechanic, but kind of go to their, as their auto wellness professional. Oh, interesting. You know, so they wanted to create, um, they wanted to lower the barrier Mm -hmm. for people to come in. And I thought that was interesting because I don't think of oil change the same way as, you know, professional, I want to lower the barrier for people to call me as their lawyer or whatever. Another um, example, but it's in the reverse, is banking. And this is my person. I always think that, you know, I see all the ads and I talk to people and I have a lot of good friends who are, are bankers and they really want the businesses, their business clients to call them and to consult with them, mm-hmm. et cetera. But there's this baggage that they have to get over that people have with the bank. Jeez, if I call my banker mm-hmm. and I tell my banker that I have a concern or God forbid, I tell my banker that or my banker finds out, I'm not really as good at reading my balance sheets and knowing my my metrics as I should, then I I show weakness to my banker and therefore I'm not a good risk and I, I'm not a good client. And so they're going to land on me with both feet. And so there's this, there's this emotional baggage that a lot of business owners have with calling their banker because they don't want to be perceived yes incorrectly well and yeah and, and banking in particular really does create a really double-edged sword again it feels a little bit like parenting and you say to your teenager you know i want you to tell me if yeah. you're in over your head somewhere but if my kid calls me and says i'm in over my head at a party and i need you to come get me mm-hmm. and then i bring them home and ground them for that right. you know i'm really going to limit how much 
Correct. how much they're going to trust me with that. And banking is a little bit just it, fairly. It's a little bit like that. You know, I could call my banker and say, you know, I'm, you know, we're, we're not doing well. You know, I need, you know, I need to figure out some options and they're going to say, well, that's nice, but like, I can't give you a line of credit because I know you're not doing well. I mean, I'm vastly oversimplifying it and that's not how all bankers Right. Unless be, they but, set up a banker confessional, you know, where one right. doesn't talk to the other, but you. Yeah. You know. it, yeah. So they, there really are consequences there of that, that, sharing. Right. But at the same time, you you see a lot of bankers genuinely, genuinely um, mean that what they say, which is we want to be viewed as partners. We want to be viewed as consultants, as resources for people. And so they've got a challenge, as many businesses do, of lowering the consequences for communication, both emotionally and financially. Uh, yeah, lowering the consequences of honest communication, even yes. specifically, yes. which hysterically back to doctors. I mean, you know, you go see your pediatrician or your doctor and they ask you all these questions about, you know, the pediatrician, are they, you know, are they eating, you know, 18 servings of vegetables a day? Of course. Yes, they are. You know, I mean, most of the things you're like, they're smoking in the house. No, like most of the things I'm honest about, but then there's this whole list of them, you know, that I'm like, oh, come on. On like, and that that the you know I'm not sure what I think the consequences are, but I decide which things I'm honest about or not. I, I feel like if it's that's another interesting piece to it of some of those things I feel like I am dealing with on my own, and I don't feel like I need their help on, and so I will be less honest if I need to be on those. Others I'm like, nope, we have an issue here, and I'll you know I but but that that thing of how honest you feel like you can be with your doctor hysterically. This is, this is really funny. I've always tried to be honest with, with my doctors when they ask you questions about sleep or how much you drink or whatever. But I, I went to see my general practitioner a few years ago and it was a different guy than I had originally, this other woman. And he was just sort of going over things. And he said, do you, um, do you still drink five to seven drinks a night? And I said, <laughs> excuse me? And he said, well, that's what it says here. I said, I, I don't, I don't drink. Maybe, maybe I said five to seven a week. I don't, I don't remember like, but it's not every week. I don't know. And I said, can you change that? And he goes, oh, sorry, we, we can't change. You know, we can't edit past that's who things. You are. And I was like, oh my God. I hope there's never like a custody battle or something. Like, so somewhere out there, there's a record that says I drink five to seven drinks every single night. And I was like, wow. Nice. But, um, but, but that I always think of that in terms of like, let, let's pretend that's true for a second. That's kind of my whole point. If I say that to my doctor, that is then part of your permanent record. And it's a, it's a, it's a loss of control about a storyline yes. and, and, I don't know that doctors, much like bankers, have an easy way around that. But without that, you then get into this problem of, I mean, I think you and I both have this same kind of thing where if you are not lowering, and it gets back to exactly the whole like me being able to come in and say, hey, my kid has a has a fever, um, lowering the barrier for honest communication without feelings of like shame or whatever, yeah. whatever it is that comes up. I think behooves every single kind of business out there. So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. <laughs> that is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. <laughs> we'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky Ooh, team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best Lovingly of ways. Snarky. Yes. <laughs> Good mockery. So, so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, first, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Thing. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.